Um, I'd like to begin by introducing our distinguished guests today, who are uh, all in their own right experts in their field with many years worth of experience. Uh, Alin, uh, you're the first esteemed guest that I'd like to introduce, uh, Alin Dobrea. Alin is the Head of Marketing Solutions and Partnerships at Zalora. Uh, he holds a Master's Degree in Strategy and Marketing from the University of Birmingham. Lynn has over nine years of in-house and agency experience with a strong track record of creating multi-channel marketing communications across a variety of industries. Lynn, thank you very much for being with us here today. How are you? Thank you, Edwin. Very good, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. A few technical issues uh, aside, not bad. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, our, Alin, our, our audience is excited to hear what you've got to share with us today. Uh, could you just give us a, a, a sort of a brief outline about what it is that you'll be sharing with us? Sure. So, I'll be discussing a bit uh, the trends from a consumer point of view uh, and based on the impact of COVID in uh, the Southeast Asia region in particular. Uh, and we'll also be sharing a bit about some of the trends that we've seen at Zalora across our categories, which I think will be interesting to the audience. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. We, we look forward to that. Um, the next guest speaker is the no less esteemed Yvonne Moisan. Uh, Yvonne, you graduated from the Ivy League, Harvard University, as well as the ESSEC Business School in Paris. Uh, he is the co he is the founder and CEO of Saint Germain Consulting, a consulting firm in digital marketing with an expertise in the banking, insurance, and retail industries. Uh, Yvonne is also a lecturer in digital marketing at the IESEG School of Management, which was ranked among the top 20 business schools by the Financial Times in 2016. That's an impressive, uh, impressive resume, Yvonne. Um, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, how are you doing? Are you well? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, it's it's a particular uh, period, but uh, we adapt uh, like uh, e-commerce industry adapt, and uh, we will cover this particular point during this session. Absolutely. Are you are you currently working from home, uh, like so many yes. people? I yes. Yes. In fact, uh, almost everything is uh, closed uh, in France. Um, we have uh, many many uh, uh, retail that uh, just open. Uh, a few hours ago, but uh, we are still in a very specific period. Absolutely. I mean, it's the same here in the United Kingdom, you know, uh, change, uh, change, adaptation, who knows what the future will bring. But uh, anyway, we look forward to hearing uh, from you later on in, in today's webinar. Um, so last, but by no means least, he hasn't joined us with his uh, video yet, but I will give him an introduction nonetheless. Um, we, it is with great pleasure that I introduce my friend and colleague, Mr. Dale Widener. Um, he is the country manager for the United States of America, and he has over 30 years worth of experience in a broad range of businesses and operations, business development and marketing. He co-founded an HP back technology company in 1997 that developed a cutting edge content management platform that is now owned by Microsoft. Uh, Mr. Widener has worked the last 20 years in international business with a focus on sourcing, supply chain and quality control. And he ran his own sourcing company for 12 years. And he's been with HQTS for the last eight years in various roles. Now, Dale is meant to be here, but he is having some, some, some issues with his video. I think that's standard for Zoom, to be honest with you. And it's just <laughs> another thing that we all really need to get used to. So hopefully he'll be jumping in a little bit later on. Right. So... Um, let's begin with the topic, the challenges and opportunities of the supply chain during and after the pandemic. Um, so Yvonne, starting with you, straight in with a question. Uh, how has COVID-19 changed retail buyers' behaviour? And do you think this is permanent as well as how do you think this has affected online purchasing? Um, I would uh, firstly start uh, to say that uh, 
uh, we will make uh, a focus, of course, on e-commerce. But uh, I would um, firstly say that e-commerce is just complementary solution to uh, a global omnichannel environment. So um, we can say that uh, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, specific period, it's both a short but also a middle and a long-term uh, solution in this uh, specific context. If we come back uh, before the COVID-19 uh, period, we can can see that uh, year on year e-commerce have seen a global uh, increase so um, uh, but it was much uh, more important uh, for sure during uh, this uh, specific Q1 if we focus on uh, Amazon for example uh, it grew up by 26 percent in Q1 so it's uh, uh, it's huge but if we uh, go to um, a global uh, chain stores online sales it goes up by 80 percent and if we uh, focus also on pickup in-store order, we can see that it goes up to 208% in April. So um, uh, for this specific uh, metric, it's very important to uh, not only focus on e-commerce, but globally on the impact on the omni-channel environment. And to answer the question, yes, it's, it's a, clearly a global shift uh, in, in also the long-term uh, period. So it means that uh, uh, if you do not have yet uh, launched your e-commerce uh, website, you really have uh, to focus on this, but also to think about uh, the global impact on your global activity, meaning that you have by default to think about what would be uh, the global um, situation uh, combining all your channels, so uh, online plus offline channels, and how you will combine both, uh, because we will have more and more uh, web to store, mobile to store um, development, and uh, this is, this is key. So do not think only about e-commerce, but globally on your omni-channel environment and impact. Um, so Yvonne, thank you very much for that answer. And I think what I'd like to do now is just shift over to uh, Alin uh, and, and ask, what would you like to, I mean, what would you like to add to Yvonne's answer? Uh, what changes in customer behavior do you see, especially from Zalora's own business angle? Yeah, so I, I guess uh, if we were to take a step back, as Yvonne mentioned, uh, we've seen a strong growth uh, for e-commerce uh, during this period. So the latest numbers from uh, Google, which were shared uh, a couple of days ago, point to a 48% year-on-year increase uh, in uh, e-commerce generic searches. And then for marketplaces like Zalora, uh, you know, they, they mentioned they see pretty much 100% year-on-year growth. Uh, so... It, it's it's incredible, right? The the rate uh, of change and how it's uh, it's been accelerated in terms of uh, user behaviors. Uh, I think we need to really think about it from a category perspective. So I think there's going to be certain categories where there's going to be a speed up uh, that's likely to sustain. There's going to be some categories that may sustain. Uh, so if we think about online groceries, uh, probably that's a category that uh, is going to is going to sustain. So a lot of customers are trying it out for the first time in a lot of markets, as well as Southeast Asia. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, categories that are unlikely to sustain. Uh, for example, uh, people that have stocked up on uh, toilet paper, for example, it's unlikely they, they're going to continue buying at the same rate. Uh, so I think there's going to be different behaviors uh, across, uh, across the different categories, but there's definitely uh, a huge, huge acceleration across all of the Southeast Asia markets. Uh, and uh, in the case study later, I'm going to share a bit more of a deep dive on how some of the categories within Zalora have, uh, have performed. Uh, uh, but that's kind of how, uh, how we're seeing it. So uh, I guess a couple of key takeaways, a lot of new, new customers uh, joining e-commerce for the first time, a lot of brands, uh, you know, uh, joining uh, e-commerce uh, either through their own efforts or marketplaces. Uh, and a lot of these customers are very likely to sustain. Uh, so I think there was a survey in Singapore, again, uh, done by Google. 75% uh, of the customers uh, that uh, shopped uh, during the lockdown period, uh, are, uh, they mentioned they're going to continue to shop uh, online after the, the lockdown period. So that's very, uh, very insightful and I guess very exciting times for businesses that are in e-commerce. 
I certainly understand everything you said, and it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, so, uh, Yvonne, um, how have certain categories changed in e-commerce purchases? I mean, it touches a little bit on, on, on what uh, Lynn has mentioned, but, but from your perspective, what sort of categories have changed in e-commerce purchases, for example, groceries? Yeah, in, I, I fully agree with uh, what Aline uh, said. Uh, we had uh, very uh, different uh, impacts uh, regarding uh, both categories. Uh, so we have seen, for example, uh, some construction suppliers that have uh, reported an uplift in uh, B2B e-commerce sales, while uh, luxury and uh, cultural goods uh, customers are seeing a decline. But maybe uh, what is also uh, interesting to uh, focus on is the fact that uh, it also impacted uh, small businesses. So uh, it's uh, something uh, globally new uh, in the fact that um, uh, so far, uh, I would say it was mainly uh, big companies and middle-sized uh, companies that really focus on e-commerce. And we had a very big shift on very small companies that really started to uh, focus on e-commerce and uh, these kind of companies uh, really expect that it will uh, pursue in the future. So if, if we focus uh, in the US, uh, for example, um, uh, some reports said that 81% of US small business really expect a long-term impact from uh, COVID-19. So it's, uh, it's a very good opportunities for uh, uh, companies that work on this environment because uh, they, they start from almost nothing. Thing. So there are so many uh, things to, to do uh, on for, for these uh, specific uh, categories. And also it, it's a lot uh, of uh, companies that are uh, very small. So um, I, I would say th they should invest a lot in IT, in uh, advertising, in uh, management uh, to cover uh, this new way uh, to, to make business. So I would say uh, instead of uh, uh, global differences that uh, we have seen in terms of categories of product, uh, I, I would mainly focus on the fact that we have also seen uh, the impact in terms of size of companies. So not only categories of product, but also size of companies. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And actually, um, it's interesting that you sort of mentioned the US. We'll get Dale's perspective, I think, a little bit later on. Um, Aline, a question for you. What strengths and weaknesses uh, in the e-commerce and retail business models were ex exposed? Uh, for example, uh, pure play. Yeah, so I think uh, there's there's a lot of uh, things that were uh, were exposed, I guess, during this uh, this period. So I think uh, looking at uh, at the companies that operate offline only, uh, we we saw that a lot of them were not uh, prepared with uh, you know the the online solutions. So I guess the digital transformation element, I think that uh, that definitely comes to mind. And I think, uh, like Yvonne mentioned, a lot of them have uh, grasped the opportunity to get uh, you know all their systems in order. And I think this is what we've seen in Southeast Asia as well. A lot of brands, SMEs as well, have onboarded on marketplaces uh, in the region. And uh, even on our platform, we have onboarded a lot of uh, brands. Uh, I think access to data is very important. And uh, for us being a data first company, that's how we make most of our decisions. Uh, we use data and uh, we apply that to pretty much everything that we do. So I think... Uh, another important thing is uh, having the most effective marketing and advertising approach, deciding which, uh, which products uh, brands uh, should promote. Uh, then other, other areas I've seen is uh, in terms of how brands have, um, have reacted. Uh, so if we look at, uh, you know, kind of their delivery times promise, uh, that's, uh, that's another thing that's been impacted. And then that has repercussions on uh, the customer experience. Uh, which then kind of goes back uh, full circle to their customer service. So uh, a lot of uh, marketplaces and uh, other e-commerce brands and just normal brands as well. I think they're having uh, a lot of uh, customer inquiries because even though we are operating through these challenging times, I think customers still expect, uh, you know, their orders to arrive, uh, you know, within a couple of days or, uh, you know, within uh, yeah. within the next day. So I think, that's uh, that's another important point. I think uh, contactless delivery and uh, new payment options. I think that's also been uh, been exposed uh, as uh, 
as being an area of, uh, of improvement. So I think there's, there's a lot of different areas, uh, you know, that uh, brands, uh, brands have to evolve and work on. And I think they, you could potentially put a lot of these under the umbrella, you know, are you, uh, are you a digital first brand and are you thinking about the digital transformation? And then I guess the, the question that could stem out of this is what is the purpose of uh, the, the store of the future and how are you going to use the retail space uh, in the future? Uh, for example, Yvonne just mentioned earlier uh, as a click and collect kind of approach and how can you, how can you adapt? Uh, so for example, certain brands in China, I know they are already implementing social distancing within the stores, but that has uh, had full, uh, full impact on the whole store experience that they previously designed. So I think a lot of areas are being impacted and a lot of strengths and weaknesses are, are, are coming to the surface at the moment. Thank you very much. And, uh, and, and Dale, from your perspective, uh, what about the United States? Yeah, I agree with Lynn. Uh, I think the situation is very similar in many respects. The only thing I might add with regard to the um, U.S. market and with specifically with respect to retailers is that those that were able to adapt more quickly were the ones that were really able to continue to maintain and even thrive in this environment, especially, for example, with uh, curbside pickup. That's a huge thing here now. Um, and it's likely to continue. A recent survey or poll was taken among thousands of consumers 63% said it was likely to continue post COVID-19. So he's seen buyer behavior change. It was kind of similar, similar in the 2008 recession. Prior to then, brand names were the king in terms of uh, consumer buying behavior. Uh, with the 2008 recession, a lot of people switched over to, um, um, you know, to the private labels. And after the recession, that didn't change. That was still a huge, became a huge part of the market. So I think the same as with curbside delivery, this will put significant pressure on smaller retailers because now with curbside delivery, um, these products such as groceries become more of a commodity. It'll put huge pressure on uh, the bottom line on profit margins because in retail, as we know, a lot of retailers rely significantly on impulse buying and the way they, they manage their shelf space, all that plays into how people buy a product. But now, that goes away with curbside delivery, with curbside pickup and delivery. So as these large retailers start to expand this, as they start to look at technologies like license plate recognition um, and other similar technologies, uh, I really think that this will become a part of the retail landscape going forward. This will put considerable pressure on the smaller retailers who do, cannot ramp up um, um, to this sort of a business model. Thanks, Dale. Could you clarify what curbside delivery is? Is that leaving the, the parcel just, just by the side of the house? No. So, for example, Walmart is a good example of this. Home Depot, Lowe's, they all provide a service now where you can make your order online. And instead of coming to pick it up at the uh, store yeah. or going into the store or having it delivered, you can just pull into the parking lot in special areas and they deliver it to your trunk or to your pickup bed or whatever the case may be. Um, this is proving very popular, especially for those who are a little bit more vulnerable. Um, it's extremely convenient. Um, a lot of people don't want to wait for delivery in some of the big boxes like uh, Home Depot, um, Lowe's, Ace Hardware. Um, they, you know, they will charge for delivery unless you order a certain amount. So for smaller items, it's very convenient just to pull into a spot. You've called in advance. They're standing there waiting for you. They know your car. Um, or your vehicle, they just put it in and you go on your way. So um, this has become quite a popular thing in the U.S. as a result of this. So the retailers that could adapt quickly to it, could ramp up to it, and already had supporting infrastructure for online ordering, um, they, they, they have done very well on this, but it's going to cause a lot of fallout for the smaller, play, smaller players. Thanks, Dale. Um, Yvonne, uh, what risk management strategies can businesses take in the future if this happens again? And, and when I say if this happens again, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, need to be a, a sort of a pandemic, but, but crises, you know, they're, they're inevitable, uh, unpredictable, but, but things like this will occur in the future. So, so what risk management strategies can businesses take? 
Um, there are there are many risks uh, regarding this uh, specific period. So you mentioned uh, the concrete example of your grandparents that started to uh, shop online. So yeah. um, we we can see first that uh, clearly we we have new type of people, new type of customers. So one big challenge is how to help them uh, to move online uh, because uh, um, you you can clearly imagine that uh, everything is completely new for them and they have potentially specific needs uh, to, uh, to, to make this uh, switch. And um, uh, what we can see in this uh, specific period that, uh, is that people need both more digital, but also more human. So it's uh, one of your challenge is how uh, to answer to this uh, specific need. As the more uh, we have a digital environment, the more people need physical uh, presence uh, to help them to, to make this uh, switch. Uh, another challenge uh, that uh, you, you can face, and you also mentioned it, uh, Edwin, is the fact that you have potentially new customers that uh, uh, go uh, on your website because they need specific uh, uh, product like toilet paper um, uh, that uh, Aline uh, uh, mentioned. So how could you make priority uh, between your existing uh, customer that uh, uh, go on your website in a regular manner and this kind of uh, customer that uh, just go for a specific uh, opportunity and maybe will never come back. So it's something that uh, you have to uh, uh, take into account. Also, uh, you have to think about what is your positioning as a brand uh, regarding this kind of uh, situation. So how could you help globally your community? Uh, maybe you can uh, offer uh, free things like uh, uh, we had uh, Netflix, for example, that offered uh, free movies uh, during uh, this uh, specific period. Maybe also you can uh, uh, offer specific uh, uh, payment uh, um, payment delay uh, to, to, uh, uh, to make sure uh, your customer will not face a financial crisis uh, situation. So um, it's, uh, it's this kind of thing that uh, you have to think about. And also, uh, there are potentially also new markets uh, that can uh, uh, be open uh, thanks to this uh, situation. So you can think about a new area, uh, new kind of products that you can offer, new kind of services that you can provide. Um, but also, uh, of course, it's a risk that other companies um, uh, took this uh, opportunity because uh, uh, there, there is a, a big demand on a specific market. Uh, and uh, so uh, you have to globally analyze the situation. What is uh, globally the, the kind of opportunity you can um, get, but also the kind of risks uh, you can potentially face. So it, it's an overall analysis that you have to do in this uh, kind of situation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, part of what you said especially resonated with me uh, working working in my role with HQTS, specifically about the, the humanizing, the, the sort of the humanized approach as well. I think uh, as, as as time goes on and, um, and and things becoming more digital, it's important to to look after your you know your clients' communities. It's really important to make sure that they're they're looked after and they they have that sort of human connection. Now, I think uh, uh, Lynn, you will share a uh, a business case with us um, specific to Zalora. Yeah. So basically, what we've done during this period is we actually recognize some of the challenges that we've identified so far. And we've developed this uh, internal tool in-house called Trender that we offered it to our brands. And what this does is it offers insights uh, to brands at a category level. So they're able to see what's happening in different categories within Zalora. And then they're also able to see what's happening within their brand and look at uh, lots of different metrics. So it's a very very interesting tool because like I mentioned before, we're a very much uh, data driven company. And this is uh, how we also like to encourage the brands that work with us uh, to look at, uh, at the data. So what we've done here uh, in this initial slide for apparel is uh, we've taken each country we operate in and uh, we split time periods in time before COVID, uh, time where we had a low alert and when we had a high alert, which means high alert, basically the offline sector was fully shut down. Uh, and then we average out the data and we provide a picture of how the consumer behavior has changed. 
Um, so if we look, for example, uh, at uh, dresses category, we can see that uh, that is actually suffering a lot, right? Uh, we can see quite a, quite a significant uh, decline. However, we, sh we see a shift in, uh, uh, in, uh, in tops and uh, that's kind of gone back to, you know, kind of more stronger previous trends. Uh, and then we also can see, you know, kind of some interesting uh, trends uh, within long pants uh, and, also, and also jeans. So I just wanted to share kind of a bit of a insight on, uh, on the apparel. If we move on to the next slide. So in terms of this is more related to who is, uh, who is buying uh, in terms of demographics. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. Again, if we look at, uh, you know, the three separate uh, uh, time periods that we identified. So pre-COVID, low alert period and high alert period, uh, we can see a massive increase uh, in uh, new customers in the age bands of 20 to 30 year olds. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we, uh, if we look at, uh, you know, the, the, the graphs, uh, the charts on the left-hand side uh, in each category, we can see quite a, quite a significant spike. So from 12%, 20, 21 to 25-year-olds, uh, all the way to 16%. So that's, that's quite, a, quite a significant increase. Uh, more, you could say it's 33% uh, increase. Uh, and then uh, what we also see as an interesting trend, and I guess it just reflects how people are spending their time, is for the first time in Zalora history, I think. Uh, so we've been operating as a marketplace uh, for the last eight years in the region. Uh, we've seen an increase, if you, if you want, or a decrease uh, in uh, phone usage of our app and a slight shift in uh, desktop usage. So that means that more people are shopping online uh, on their desktops uh, as opposed to shopping on the go. So I think it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite an interesting uh, insight uh, that. If we move on to the next slide, uh, we can go into a bit more detail on the sports category. Uh, so I guess uh, here we can see again which, uh, which segments are being affected uh, during the high alert period. So again, when... Uh, when most markets are uh, in lockdown. So we can see again that uh, uh, shoes, uh, both lifestyle and performance shoes, you know, we, we have a, a significant increase, uh, uh, sorry, a decrease, uh, decrease in those categories. So they're taking a, a, a hit. However, we see the other trend, uh, the rise of the athleisure and uh, sports apparel. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's quite, quite interesting how the, you know, the tops, uh, uh, both lifestyle and performance and uh, performance bottoms as well uh, has seen a, a high increase uh, during uh, the high alert period uh, and also during uh, the, the low alert period. So meaning that more people are buying, uh, you know, sports equipment to exercise, uh, sports gear to exercise at home uh, or around, uh, around their houses during the, the neighborhood. And then if we go to the next slide, a bit of a sports the deep dive. Um, again, uh, younger customers uh, coming, uh, coming through, uh, and this is a customer base uh, Indonesia deep dive. Uh, so uh, we see again the, the increase, as you can see during, uh, uh, during uh, the, um, the high alert period for uh, younger customers. So again, the 21 to 25 year olds moving from 21% to 30%. Uh, and um, yeah, that's, that's quite significant uh, in, in that case. So again, we're seeing a lot of new customers coming from uh, this segment. And then if we were to look at the customer genders, uh, again, we see a small increase uh, in the male uh, shoppers. So Zalora is essentially uh, predominantly fashion uh, e-commerce and the majority of our customers are female. So again, very interesting to see uh, uh, increase uh, in, uh, in uh, the, the male uh, customers. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think this is kind of the, the, the main insights I wanted to share. So I, I'm hoping this gives a, a, a bit of a interesting picture on how some categories are performing better than others. And to be honest, it's a bit expected. Uh, uh, again, with uh, the new customer behaviors and customers being stuck at home. Thank you very much, Lynn. What I'll do is I'll move on now to uh, our deep dive into the supply chain um, uh, ecosystem. 
Uh, I'd just like to remind everyone at this point uh, that if you do have any questions, and, I, and, and I'm sure everyone does, please type them into the Zoom chat and we'll do our best to address these in the final section. Um, so, so if you think of a question, don't worry, you can type it down immediately. Um, now that we've heard of Lynn's case, this gives us a great chance to take that deep dive into the supply chain ecosystem as it moves forwards. Uh, Dale, perhaps you'd like to share your thoughts on this. Yeah, I'd be happy to. In fact, I've got a um, little um, presentation put together for this some slide, uh, um, slide deck that I'll share here. So I'll share my screen. So the, the big reason we want to talk a little bit about the supply chain, of course, is because with the disruption from this crisis, a lot of, um, a lot of buyers were, you know, were, were uh, found to be, you know, flat footed. I mean, they were not prepared for this. They, they, they couldn't figure out what, you know, where the disruptions were, how their supply chain was being affected and that sort of thing. So this is just kind of a little primer on um, the supply chain ecosystem and why it's really important to take a deep dive into it, really understand the supply chain. Because we know the um, issues that come with opaque supply chains. Um, back in the mid 2000s, we had toxic drywall that came into the United States. Hundreds of thousands of homes were, um, you know, were damaged from it. Um, we've seen major brands tout their, uh, you know, their ethical manufacturing with jeans, for example, but you know, sort of overlooked um, until they were forced to acknowledge unethically harvested cotton. Um, you might remember when melamine was added to baby formula to make it look like it had, uh, you know, more protein in it than it really did. Um, but one major toy manufacturer experienced significant uh, levels of lead in their, um, uh, in their toys. We probably all remember the worker suicides at iPhone factories. And um, Apple was basically forced to pull back the curtain on Foxconn in terms of some, um, you know, unethical and even illegal labor uh, practices there. And then counterfeit products. And then what we're really seeing today, uh, the biggest problem today is, is, uh, is with disruptions. Um, at any rate, just, you know, the point is, is that it's, it, there, there, it continues to be an increasing demand for transparency in the supply chain. And that's really what we're going to focus on. Just a quick look at the supply chain. This is a very simplistic form. Uh, and generally raw materials go to a supplier who then produces finished goods that then go to the buyer. Of course, they're a little more complex than that. Some are very complex. Suppliers will have sub subcontractors. Suppliers will have their own suppliers, for example. So under what we're talking about here today is really everything upstream, the upstream supply chain from the buyer. That's really what our focus um, is going to be here um, in our discussion today. And the importance of really understanding that um, entire supply chain um, in order to uh, deal with uh, these disruptions and to create transparency. We're going to talk a little bit about mapping, managing the supply chain, measuring it, um, diversification of it, and um, partnering um, to improve supply chain transparency and, and, uh, and uh, management. Of course, the first important thing is mapping the supply chain. That's looking into it very deeply, um, looking at all the links. How does everything fit together? You know, who are your supplier suppliers? Who are the subcontractors? Where are the raw materials coming from? Um, uh, even such things as, as what information, uh, what data should be shared? How is it shared and to who is it shared? All of these things is quality and integrity, integrity baked into the system. All of these things will really help uh, um, company get a much better view into their supply chain. The second thing is managing the supply chain to create visibility, um, transparency, and improvement. This is all the way from vendor selection all the way through the pre-production, during production, post-production process. And um, a key part of this is collaboration. Now, of course, there's a lot of different platforms for managing the supply chain. Um, some are better than others. Some have very good collaborative tools. Some don't. The collaboration is so important. Um, data sharing, which Aline mentioned, that's very, very important. That's kind of the king in supply chain management because uh, that's really what you can, uh, how you can analyze, uh, you know, create these feedback loops into your supply chain so you can do course corrections, uh, so you can improve the flow and transparency. Um, the use of uh, new technologies such as peer-to-peer -peer networks um, and these sorts of things really help a company to engage with their supply chain in a collaborative way so that the supply chain, all those links in the supply chain really become a partner uh, to the company um, and to, to improve the supply chain at every level. 
measuring the supply chain. Again, we're going to get back to two things, the uh, um, uh, product pro provenance, which is a big thing. You know, where does my product come from and what, what is it made of? I mean, this speaks to fraud and counterfeiting in the supply chain, which is a very important thing to overcome. Um, we've really seen it with medical products, for example, in the U.S. A lot of products have come in that have been labeled, you know, with 3M, for example, millions of items that have proved to be fraudulent. Um, others, if there have been impurities and hand sanitizers and things such as this. So, you know, product providence is very important um, and understanding your supply chain will help you to, to, um, to be able to track that, which, in, you know, tracking includes such things as tagging, labeling, DNA, uh, laced, invisible ink, things like that the industry is using now that's become very important. And then performance data, data. it's a, a, lin, a lens thing for sure. But on the supply chain side, of course, it's very important as well. So you can really measure how your supply chain is doing at every level. And then you can go back um, through feedback and sharing of this data, understand where the weak points are and make whatever course corrections are necessary. Then diversification is very important. And COVID-19 has certainly, certainly shown that. Um, because there's been, uh, in recent years, there's been a, you know, kind of a trend towards um, single source and single region sourcing, and that's proved to be a disaster uh, during a crisis. Now, of course, there's a lot of reasons for a crisis, not just COVID-19, right? There can be, um, in addition to other health issues, there could be trade issues, um, there can be conflict, uh, regional conflicts, um, there can be political issues. All these things can lead to supply disruptions. And by looking at ways of diversifying your supply chain, it will give a, a buyer flexibility and resiliency. And that's very important because that really determines the speed with which you're able to respond to issues and opportunities when, um, uh, when these issues do arrive, arise. So that's very important. And then finally, partners in your supply chain. Of course, um, all companies have finite resources, and this is where industry partners can be helpful, whether it's supply chain companies, quality control companies, logistics, whatever the case may be, these companies can help a buyer improve their reach, increase their flexibility, um, improve transparency, and reduce risk. So now we're going to take a few minutes and talk about HQTS best practices. Now, I want to apologize. I know this is going to sound a little bit like a sales pitch. That's not really our intent here. We're using HQTS as an example to demonstrate um, how a third party provider, supply chain provider can be an important element in your supply chain strategy to enable you to accomplish the things you need to do in terms of flexibility, in terms of transparency, um, and in terms of really understanding and managing your whole supply chain. So just a real quick overview of the current situation from the HQTS perspective. Um, Asia remains a top sourcing destination. Uh, we all know that. We can see it. If you compare 2019 service locations to 2020 service locations um, for HQTS, and this is up through April, you'll see that there hasn't been a lot of change, a little change in the uh, sort of central region of China, which is understandable. There's been some adjustments. There are some um, fewer service areas in some areas, but then there's been some added. So this is all due to um, the impact of, of COVID-19. But significant risks remain, right? There can be a second round. There can be more peaks. We don't really know what will happen. Again, the other things I mentioned, trade conflict. Um, some countries, um, present company included, are talking about isolationist policies as a good thing. Some people are anyway. So these things can affect uh, or cause disruptions in the supply chain as well. So during COVID-19, we'll just talk a, a moment about some of the things that HQTS did, did, did to step up and assist our clients in dealing with it in a very proactive way. Uh, for example, we immediately did order fulfillment uh, surveys with our customers to find out where they stood with their orders, what was happening in their supply chain, um, where they were having difficulties. And then we developed emergency services, a suite of emergency services to help them deal um, with those issues. For example, vendor sourcing, PPE became a huge thing, um, as we all know. And so Many companies were looking for help in finding uh, qualified vendors, so we were able to give assistance there. Um, compliance confirmation, we were able to help look at these products and determine whether or not they really met, you know, met the compliance requirements. Um, testing and that sort of thing. Specialized emergency services such as uh, um, rapid audits where we could very quickly go out and assess 
a vendor where in cases where not, the clients could no longer, no longer travel to the region. So this became very important as they started to expand and find new uh, vendors. And then production monitoring, again, because they could no longer travel and some of their staff went back, had to go home. Um, now we were able to step into some of these roles and help in these areas um, in a very proactive way. Um, as far as the future with the HQTS, these are some of the new things that we have developed or in the process of developing. We're getting involved in more early stage consulting with our clients. Um, this really has to do with design of products, spec development, um, sample testing, and, and product launch in terms of uh, the, uh, the uh, um, product launch in the, in the supply chain process. Um, production planning and QC management. So now we can help companies go in and, and, you know, and really work with their suppliers to make sure that they're going to be able to meet expectations and that their quality systems don't suffer or find ways to, to improve them if that's needed. Data services, again, data is very important here. Um, so, you know, collecting uh, vendor performance data, uh, KPIs, that sort of thing, then providing that um, quickly to our customers will help them to really better understand how their vendors are performing so that they can make changes or so that they can uh, make course corrections as needed. Um, then CAPA, Corrective and Preventive Action Management. Um, we assist our customers with that and supplier development. So these are all things that HQTS has done as a result, of, not specifically as a result, but partially as a result of COVID-19 and we've stepped up development of these and deployment of these as a result of COVID-19. Um, to really help our customers. And again, the goal is transparency in the supply chain, right? To make sure that uh, everybody's getting what they expect to get, and it's the quality that they expect to get and that their consumers expect it will be. And so that's really our goal. So again, this wasn't meant to be a sales pitch. I know it sounded like it, but you know, we didn't mean it that way. We li really just want to um, give our attendees an idea of how important, whether it's, whether it's QC or supply chain companies or listed, whatever it is, these companies can provide a valuable element in, uh, in terms of adding value to your supply chain. And that's really where we kind of fit into that picture as well. Um, our services and other uh, provider services really help you develop transparency and flexibility in the supply chain, which is becoming increasingly important. Um, helping you understand the supply chain so you can avoid uh, the risks that come with disruption. So that's it for me, Ed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dale. Um, so I do have some questions showing up. Uh, the first one for uh, Alinda Rare. Uh, you win. You're in the hot seat at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for, for sharing your slide. Um, from the supply chain side, did you face any product shortage issues during COVID-19 and how did you address that? Um, so yeah, that's a very good question, and I think uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a quite interesting one. Uh, um, so in our case, we did not face any significant shortages in uh, any of the categories. I uh, I, uh, I think uh, that was actually a good thing for our side. So and also from a logistics point of view, all major routes were either minimally or there was no impact uh, at all uh, in terms of uh, lead times. Uh, and uh, costs, so that's uh, that's kind of where where we where we were at. But I, I'm assuming that's probably not the case with uh, everybody else, because uh, I know there were some issues in some some other markets and some other marketplaces. Ah, thank you very much, Alin. Um, we have a question for Dale. <laughs> uh, Dale, uh, please, can you make sure to share your slides? Um, share your slides with us, um, because because we'd like to distribute that. Um, uh, we'd like to distribute that. Yvonne, I have a question for you. Um, from the uh, lessons that we've learned against uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, where, where, where have the changes been besides Dale's points uh, required to upstream supply chain management or for, for e-commerce? So, um, 
there are there are many aspects uh, to 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 cover. Um, I would say uh, maybe uh, uh, the the reassurance of the customer um, if uh, you have uh, enough uh, product uh, to sell, where exactly is uh, the order? So to make sure the the customer has in real time uh, potentially uh, the information where is exactly uh, uh, the order uh, could be an, an important point. Uh, also, um, the pricing model uh, could be something to manage in uh, in certain uh, e-commerce websites. Uh, the the price of uh, the product can change depending on the demand, and sometimes it's something automatic. So in this kind of uh, uh, situation, for sure, you have maybe to adapt uh, and make it more manual uh, to make sure you will not have uh, negative. Uh, uh, feedback in return uh, saying that uh, uh, this company is trying just to make more money uh, with uh, uh, the situation. So uh, it's, uh, it's something you have uh, also to, to manage uh, in this kind of uh, situation. Uh, th thank you very much, Yvonne. I think we have one more question incoming. I'm just waiting for the boffins to send it across to me. Um, while we wait for that, um, um, what I'd like to say is, I think I think we don't really have any time anymore. We do for one more question. You'll be pleased to know. Um, so, so what do you what do you propose to buyers looking for products from Asia, such as PPE, um, that that can find reliable and honest suppliers? As there's been a lot of so so, so it was mentioned previously that there's been a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, sort of no, uh, notoriety for example a supplier will say a supplier will say um, this is this is medical grade face masks and then they'll send face masks that perhaps don't have the correct um, that they're not what they're proposed to be so what steps I think for Dale what steps can suppliers take uh, what, what steps can buyers take to prevent that from happening um, yeah, well, there's there's a couple of important steps. First is you know doing a good assessment on your on your vendor to begin with on the supplier. I mean that's the first step. Um, you know it's difficult to do now for many companies because if they don't have staff in China, for example, they have to rely on a third party like HQTS. But we're well equipped. I mean third parties are well equipped to really take a close look at these vendors, and um, they can look at their operations. They can look at their quality control systems. Um, they can look at their pre-production process, their sourcing process. They can look at the at the ecosystem of the supplier, if you will, to really see where all of these, you know, all of their components or materials are coming from. So this is a very, very important first step. And then the next step is to is to is to look at the process during production. So you you kind of had a pre-production view. Now you look at the process during production. Now during this time, you can make sure there are no there are no uh, material substitutions. You can, be, you can be sure that there are no shortcuts being taken and that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, a, a pre-shipment inspection, uh, you know, just to, just to make sure that, you know, boxes haven't been loaded and switched. And, you know, these kind of things just happen. We know it. And in a time now where, you know, things are still difficult for everybody, um, everybody's doing the best they can to make a buck. And so buyers just have to be cautious in this environment. And then the second thing is testing. Um, you know, working with a reputable testing um, organization like HQTS, for example, um, we can take a very, very close look based on regulatory standards of these products, and we can give you a report that will, you know, define very quickly whether or not it's what you think it should be. Um, so these are a couple of very important things that a company can do to make sure that they're going to get what they think they should be getting. Thanks, Dale. Uh, one, 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 one more question for you as well, and, and this links in very closely with what we've heard from Alin and, and Yvonne and indeed yourself. Um, but, but obviously, grocery grocery store shopping now is has has increased. You know, it absolutely has increased uh, on an e-commerce level. Um, but do you think that that will be maintained for the long term? You know, it, is it is it likely to to dip off? Um, dramatically once once sort of uh, once the world starts to open up a little bit more following the pandemic or are we likely to see um, are we likely to see a, sort of a, a plateau perhaps yeah there's been some interesting forecasts about that in the USA market I can't speak for other places in the world uh, but in the USA they as I mentioned with curbside delivery they expect this to continue at some level 
Um, it's very convenient when people get used to it. Um, how retailers will respond to it over time remains to be seen because again, they want to push traffic back into the store because of the you know because of impulse buying. They really need that. That's a big part of their you know business model. So they're going to have to adjust their business model if they make curbside delivery an ongoing part of this because then that will just be a race to the bottom in terms of pricing. Groceries just become a commodity then, and when you're selling a commodity, the margins are very very low, and uh, you know you're not making money in, in all the other um, you know all the other impulse buy items. So. But most experts agree that yes, just as we experienced in 2018 with the recession, uh, buyer behavior has changed now. They've experienced something new, they've embraced it, they like it, and so it will, it'll, it'll probably drop off some for sure, but most experts agree that it'll com continue at some level for sure. And those, those, uh, those retailers that do a good job of engaging with it will probably thrive in that yeah. environment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dale. One last question to all of you. So this is open to, to anybody's input. Um, from uh, As a Hong Kong company, uh, we have limited control over product quality during production at the moment, as we cannot travel. So since we have small orders, are there any suggestions more fitting to the current situation? Work with a work with a provider that can help you. <laughs> that's the sim that's that's just that is the reality. That's a simple that's a simple fact of the matter. Even with so small orders, it's a cost effective solution because the risk is high if you don't ensure the quality. I mean that's just a reality. We're dealing with a lot of small orders, air freight orders, things like that. Customers know they need to get eyes on it, and so that's the best way to do it. There we are. We'll, we'll leave our we'll leave our details behind at the end for anybody who wishes to take them. Right, <laughs> that's the easiest way to answer. All right, I'm going to draw the questions to a close here because we've overran a little bit. Uh, I would just like to take this moment to pass on my my most sincere thanks to each Alin, Yvonne, and Dale for taking time out of your busy busy days to be with us here today. Thank you very very much. Um, there has been a lot of information shared, a lot of information provided and discussed. So please be sure, so this is for all the attendees, that we will be releasing a recording of today's webinar as soon as we can. Um, for me personally, the key takeaways here have been that really no matter what, with careful planning, close support and by looking forward, our customers can safeguard themselves and their futures. Um, HQTS will be sort of focused on supporting our customers' communities and providing tailored solutions. Uh, we support our customers based uh, as they adapt to the ever-shifting supply chain. Uh, you know, as Dale mentioned, it's all about early involvement. It's all about early involvement. And it's been, it's proved to be critical to our clients' operations. And quite frankly, it, it will continue to, to, to be that critical as the years go by. Thank you again to you guys. Thank you very much to all the attendees. And I wish you uh, all a great morning, great afternoon, great evening. Good night, Dale. Good night to you. Um, yeah, all the best. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks, Alin. Thanks, Yvonne. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.